it really is. Um, but I mean, in a way, it's kind of nice that we can do stuff like this. So yeah, well, I'm really glad that we. Yeah. Can I um I have to say I completely agree. I think that's one thing that's super exciting about you know where we're, where we are right now. Um, you know, it has forced us all to be kind of creative and think around. You know, what? How can we do things differently? Um, in terms of your pop-up shops, is that um, has that been a response to the Corona crisis, or did you have that in play before? I know you had physical pop-ups before. Yes, yeah, so that was definitely a response to the crisis. Um, and because a lot of landlords had empty retail units yeah. and everyone going in um, and a very um, unsure climate out there. Um, so yeah, so we were quite fortunate about that. Yeah, I've just got yeah. a couple of people um, in the waiting room and I'm conscious of keeping people waiting too long. Um, sure. Are you all kind of ready to go? Yeah, I think so. Perfect. Um, okay, so I'll let everyone come in and then I tend to give it like five minutes in case people are just kind of looking for the link kind of like yeah point. Fine. Um, fine and then um yeah I think I need to make you host for you to be able to share your screen so <laughs> hopefully Maybe. you won't be um having to kind of manage the attendees um but it should be fine yeah wicked that sounds really good great let's let everyone in cool Cool. And everyone should be on mute, so you don't have to worry about people piping up. <laughs> <laughs> um, can people unmute themselves if they want to? Because if if anybody does want to pipe up, I'd um, you know, more than more yeah, than yeah. So um, the way we usually kind of run it is that people can pop questions into the chat box, and I'll keep an eye on it. Okay. Um, and then if anyone has any questions, I'll read them out. So don't have to worry, like no one needs to hold back if they've got any okay, questions okay. or anything. Um, got my beady eye. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. Ooh. Great. So hello to everyone who is joining us now. We've got a few more people coming. So we'll be starting in five minutes or so. Um, yeah, very excited to have so many people here for a Wednesday, sunny Wednesday afternoon. Um, not everyone outside. <laughs> no, I'm um, so yeah. Um, yeah, so we we're just saying if you don't mind keeping your microphone switched off just for the duration of the talk. Um, and then there's always time for Q&A. Um, if anyone has any questions, just put it in the chat box, um, which I will be closely monitoring um, and can always dive in if need be. And do feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, does that work for you, Emma, if everyone asks questions at the end or would you like them throughout? Yeah, um, I'm more than happy with questions at the end. Um, you know, unless in, if anybody has anything sort of pressing, I'm, I'm absolutely easy. Um, right. Whatever works, really. Perfect. Cool. Uh, let me just make sure I'm looking at the chat box. Give it a couple more minutes and then we will kick off. Are you happy, Amanda, if um, just while I'm going through the main presentation, mm -hmm. I might switch my camera off just I, I find it really um disconcerting when i can see myself <laughs> i can see myself speaking <laughs> no, of course, Is that okay? Of course. okay yeah no, do, do whatever you need to do i know <laughs> it's always fun when you you have video calls with people and you just know that they're looking at themselves yeah it's, it's kind of like talking into a mirror, isn't it? It's, it's really odd. It is very <laughs> distracting. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> no worries at all. We've definitely found over the last few months, um, you know, at work, they'll, 
some people prefer to have their cameras on and then um, other people, um, you know, just prefer to, to not, you know, it's, it, there's quite a strong feeling of preference, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. I definitely felt like that right at the beginning of lockdown when it was like, you just roll out of bed straight onto like your computer. Yeah. And like hardly any time for a coffee between the two. Um, yeah. But then I think that kind of slowly changed as people, you know, made more time for a routine in the morning, which is important. Completely, completely. I've actually been learning yoga, which I never thought I would do. How's uh, that going? It's, um, yeah, it's quite good. I can actually touch my toes now. <laughs> <That's sick. laughs> it's always good to know they're there. Yeah, but, yeah exactly. Um, but yeah, I think it's been um, also from that sort of conference call um, point of view, you know, before all of this happened, the idea of doing a conference call was actually a bit of a hassle. Um, and it's, I think, you know, I guess you're sort of used to FaceTime, but, but actually this becoming a sort of common mode of communication, it's, it's really forced us to, to work differently and get used to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it feels coming out of this that we're um, likely to work very differently anyway you know yeah. we've got used to things that we just wouldn't do otherwise definitely I think a lot of companies are going to be a lot more open to letting people work from home kind of yeah long term than they are now yeah okay well it is five past um, and people can always drop in and join us um, if they feel they've got time, um, any time throughout the talk. Um, but this conversation is also being recorded, so anyone who signed up and didn't get the link, um, signed up but didn't have enough free time today um, to join us, which is fair enough, midweek, um, they can receive the link. So no need for anyone to be missing out. Um, and yeah. So thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Amanda from Lone Design Club. I'm currently working on um, the events and accelerator program um, of which this is a part of. Um, for those of you who don't know what Lone Design Club is, we are a kind of community that unites and supports independent designers. Um, by giving them a direct route to their customer, which is normally through pop-up stores, which kind of take place all over London and other countries, um, but has mainly been through the online in the past few months. Um, and now I'm excitedly coming to you from our South Morton Street pop-up, which is a completely shoppable digital window. Um, and if anyone wants to learn more about that, then feel free to get in touch. Um, everyone should have my email address and we'll be following up with you tomorrow. Um, but yes, the Accelerator is kind of a platform within that community that we have created to um, provide small brands with information that they need to become bigger brands scale and do it all in a sustainable process um, and provide them with kind of guidance, inspiration um, and the context that they require. Um, so if anyone has anything that they want to share or any kind of information that they would like to hear more about, um, then always drop us a message. Um, you can email me, it's amanda at lonedesignclub.com. Um, but yes, enough about that. Um, still a few people joining us here, which is great. Um, let's talk about you, Emma. Um, and if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask throughout, um, please just drop them in the group chat and make sure you're sending it to everyone. Um, and I will be keeping a BDI on this, so I will be able to ask your questions for you. Um, and with that all being said, I'd love to hand over to you, Emma. So let me just make you the host and you can share your screen for us. So yes, give us a quick introduction to yourself. 
Thank you. Um, thanks for that, Amanda. Uh, let me, I'll share my screen now. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, can you see that? Yes, perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so thank you um, for the introduction and the opportunity um, to uh, chat through some ideas today, Amanda. Um, so a wee bit about me, I'm from Selfridges, where I currently work for Selfridges um, Creative Direction. Um, I have worked for Selfridges probably for about 10 years. I've actually worked for them three times, so kind of on and off. But the bulk of that time I've worked in creative direction. Um, and lots of people actually say, what does creative direction mean to a department, uh, department store? Um, so really just to, to give you guys a bit of an indication of what creative direction is, we, or Selfridges employs um, around about 300 creatives and we operate a bit like a, a sort of internal creative agency. And that tends to be quite unusual, I think, for, for retailers that really all the, the creative work happens in house. So beyond the windows, which I think is probably the obvious thing for Selfridges, um, we also work on ad campaigns, fashion film, um, immersive experiences and installations. We do lots of parties, um, pop-ups spanning music, theatre and art, um, of course, graphics and design. So we have lots of different uh, creative teams, essentially, that work on all of those different outputs. And creative direction, from that point of view, they are essentially the seed of those, those creative teams. So we're the people really who develop those initial uh, concepts. We make sure all those creative uh, teams are essentially talking to one another and um, producing something that is kind of um, holistic in its point of view. And we're also the team that really are um, absolutely engaged in the zeitgeist. So we're responsible for ensuring that Selfridges sort of remains relevant. And we always have this eye on the future. So where are we going next, essentially? So that's what Creative Direction is. Um, just to give you an idea of my background, 10 years at Selfridges, um, the rest of my career I've, spe I've spent in women's wear design. I don't know if there are any Kiwis uh, joining us today. I've largely worked with New Zealand fashion designers, um, Karen Walker, Helen Cherry, Workshop Denim. Um, and also just um, so you guys know, I'm um, working on a bit of a side hustle at the moment. So it's a, a small women's wear brand. I haven't launched it yet, um, but I think that's relevant to note because what I've tried to do today is essentially think about what I do at Selfridges and what I've learned along the way and what can I take from that that I can apply to my own business. And I hope those insights, the kinds of things that I'm thinking about that I'm sort of learning from, from Selfridges and my experience to bring to my business, I'm hoping some of that will be useful for you guys as well. Um, so I think that's everything about me. I'm just going to uh, pop my video off. Um, let's see if this works. Okay, brilliant. <clears throat> um, So I've called this masterclass, How to Feel the Future, which sounds like a bit of an odd title, I guess. Um, 
the main reason why I've called it how to feel the future is this importance, I think, of intuition. It's something um, that increasingly, as uh, businesses um, develop these days, we're obsessed with data, um, we're obsessed with science um, and commerciality and growth. And all of those things can, uh, can sort of drown out, I suppose, this, um, our natural intuition. Um, so hopefully throughout this presentation, um, you'll, you will kind of begin to see how I'm, I'm really um, banging the drum, I suppose, of intuition. And I think it's really interesting actually through science we are beginning to understand that this notion of gut feeling is an actual thing. Um, so the sort of mind body connection, the emotional brain, um, what they call the limbic brain, it, it's, an, it's an actual thing and we need to pay attention to it. And I think that's just as useful in our business lives as it is in our personal lives. So that's why I've called it how to, how to feel the future. Um, but I really wanted to start to say congratulations to, to all of you guys who've joined us. I am presuming that the majority of you have your own brands and businesses or you're thinking about starting or you have started. And if that is the case, then I think you need to remember that you have already beaten 76.6% of your competition just by starting. So working on your own brand and business, it's, um, it's incredibly tough. Um, you'll meet lots of failures along the way. You will have to be super, super confident in, in your own work and your beliefs in your brand. And that can be really demoralizing. So I think you need to remember really that you are already winning. The fact that you have started is amazing because 64% of people in the UK actually want to work for themselves. They want to start their own businesses, but only 15% of people actually do. I've had so many com uh, conversations with people who sort of said, oh yeah, I've got this idea. But it's, you know, the idea is really only a tiny fraction of um, what it takes to make a successful business. Um, so I think it's just something to, to remember all the time that you are absolutely achieving just by starting. But now you've started, where are you going? So the first thing I suppose that I've really learned from Selfridges and, and working with big corporations is this notion of um, a vision, uh, a purpose, a mission. So, you know, if you take any sort of classic bit of business studies, they'll, they'll say you, you need a vision statement, a mission statement, etc. cetera. Um, and I have noticed, you know, if you speak to really any kind of um, business exec, they can't really tell you the difference between a vision, a vision and a mission and a purpose. Um, the thing that's really important is simply that you know where you're going. You really have a direction. Um, and that is your vision. So your vision, I suppose, when you think about it, it sounds obvious, but how clearly can you see where you want to go? Um, it's really important to take some time to really picture that in your mind, to really crystallize your vision. And you need a crystal clear picture of your vision in order for you to make decisions, um, to really take the right paths to get to where you want to go. You need to know where you want to go first, right? But one thing I suppose that I've been thinking about that I'd be interested to experiment with um, is this idea of vision boards. So again, if you look at big corporations, they all have vision statements, you know, it's a sentence. Um, our vision statement at Selfridges is to be the um, destination for the most extraordinary customer experience. 
and that has got us a long way. However, if you look at sort of current thinking in behavioural psychology, they talk about vision boards. And this is really for, um, you know, personal development, stress relief, um, people being able to achieve their goals. Um, and a vision board is that, that classic visual mood board where, you know, you paint a picture of the life that you really want to lead. And you might have images of, you know, tropical holidays or the big house you want to live in or, um, you know, whatever it is you want to do. Um, and the reason why vision boards are said to be very successful are one, you tend to put them up in a place where you see every day. So you're visualizing this, this goal of yours every day. Um, but because they're pictures rather than words, essentially it bypasses the, the cerebral cortex and goes straight to the intuitive and visual parts of your brain. So you're really um, digging your vision right into your intuition. And it means that you can begin to subconsciously take decisions to get you to the place you want to get to. Um, so really, this is just something I'm quite interested in experimenting with um, for me and my business is rather than purely having a vision statement can I build a vision board um, that will help me get to where I want to get to? There's loads of stuff that you can read about uh, vision boards. Um, Dr. Tara Swartz is quite a good one. Um, she's recently um, published a book um, that can help explain sort of how you go about building vision boards, but that's definitely something I'm interested in. Um, and then once you have a vision, the other thing that's super important is your purpose. So your vision is where you want to go, but your purpose really is, you know, why are you useful? What are you doing for people? Why do people um, need you essentially? Or why does the planet need you? What are you doing that is really going to change the status quo? Um, I've got a, uh, a bit of a comedy video to share with you now. Um, it's by Simon Sinek, and he really talks about this um, importance of purpose. It will probably make your toes curl a little bit because um, he's, he's quite smug, but I think it really helps articulate what we're getting at here. Why? How? What? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. 
here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Um, so hopefully that uh, helps really to articulate this notion of purpose and, and the importance of it. So we've talked about our vision and our purpose, but what's your story? This, I think, is really interesting. Again, sort of off the back of what Simon Sinek was talking about, you might have amazing product, but what is going to make people um, even find out about it in the first place? What is the thing that is really going to interest people in your brand, your ideas, your products? And that's what we're calling um, What's Your Story? So the way I look at this really is um, if you imagine one of your customers, what are they going to tell their friends about your brand? Um, if you're speaking to somebody in the lift, what are you going to tell them um, that is going to make them interested in your brand? Again, if you're a journalist, what are they going to write in an article um, that, it, that is interesting, essentially. I think this is almost one of the hardest things um, to articulate. And one thing I think could be useful is really talking to a couple of your friends, telling them um, about your story and seeing really what part of your story they're most interested in. It, it could be the product, but it could equally be something to do with your own life story and, and the reason why you started your business in the first place. Um, it might be something to do with the artisans who make your product. Um, so to articulate this idea of story, I've got a couple of brands um, that I particularly like the stories of. So the first one is looking at the luxury hotel sector. This is Et Hem, it's a boutique hotel it's designed by Ilsa Crawford. So as you can see just from this image, it's, it's gorgeous. But what are you going to tell people about it? Apart from, it, you know, it's a beautiful hotel in Sweden. Um, so really, the clue is in the name. Et hem means at home. And the idea of this hotel is when you walk in, you feel absolutely at home. So the receptionists aren't sitting behind a desk. They come and shake your hand, make sure you feel um, at home. You can help yourself to drinks in the bar. You can walk into the kitchen whenever you want to, talk to the chefs, they can cook you whatever you'd like for dinner. So the whole concept of feeling at home is felt throughout the hotel. And that is the thing that really um, a journalist would write about. It would be the thing that you would tell your friends and family about. Um, so that's the story of this hotel. Looking at fashion, um, I love this idea, um, the knitwear brand John Sterner. So this was um, created by the same guy who did Stutterheim Rainwear. And his ambition is to make the world's best knitwear. And there's an image on the right there of, of his knitwear. Again, it looks gorgeous. I'm sure there's hundreds of companies that want to make the world's best knitwear. The thing that is really, to me, most compelling is that they're aiming to make this knitwear all from a tiny island in Sweden. And you can see that there on the left. And if you want to, you can go to an island in Sweden um, and go to his um, cabin and pick up the jumper from there. You can also obviously order it online. Um, but again, the story behind that brand is so compelling. If I saw the image on the right, I'd think gorgeous image. Am I going to buy it? Am I going to find out more? But when you really get drawn into the story, you know, this is something that has really stayed with me ever since I found out about it. So what's your story? 
And then moving on from what's your story, can you build on that story and can you really build your own world? I think most of us, when we think about building a world around a brand, um, you know, personally, the, the my first um, ideas around sort of, you know, Instagram really, um, put a load of great pictures on Instagram and straight away you have an idea of what your brand is, is about. Um, a couple of good examples that I've been following recently, Alex Eagle Sporting Club, you know, you can tell just from scrolling through Instagram that she's sort of quite preppy, public school, rich, exclusive, you know, be part of the club, be part of Alex Eagle Sporting Club. Um, Love Aesthetics is a great one. Um, Ivania Carpio is a real die-hard minimalist. She only wears black, white or grey. She's a great example of someone who has absolutely nailed her image. So even if you lifted um, a, a photograph of hers um, away from Instagram, you would know that it was one of hers, essentially. And then if you think about somebody like Jacquemus, again, scroll through his Instagram, you know that his brand is all about joyfulness. It's the south of France, it's colour. Um, so the main things about building a world like this, a, a, and a world of imagery, I suppose, is really defining your parameters and making them as narrow as possible and not straying from them. I think we need to be really mindful that um, you know, generally as creatives, it's very, very hard to sort of stick to one thing. You always sort of want to bring more stuff in there. Um, but your customers will see essentially everything that you put out there. So if you're all about black and white and then you post a couple of rainbow images, you really are confusing your message. So the more singular you can be, the better. However, um, Beyond this idea of that sort of world of imagery, um, how much further can you go? I think a great example of this is um, Margella. Um, and if anyone hasn't yet seen the documentary in his own words, I would really recommend um, watching it. It came out um, a couple of months ago now. And it really reminds you how, um, how much of a world, I suppose, Martin Margiela um, built. And it was everything from, as you can see here, the, the aesthetic and the concept behind the clothes and the, the interest in deconstruction and the asking why. Um, sorry. But it's also the, you know, looking at the label, the graphics, the way the garments are presented. Um, the packaging, as you see here on the right, um, and the, the absolute level of detail. Also his shop fits, the graphics in his stores, um, and, and the imagery itself and his own studio. Um, and then looking at here, his um, shows. And I think probably most importantly is this external image, the external world that he painted was absolutely imbued through everything he did, including you'll see shots here of his um, atelier. Um, you know, everyone's in a white coat. The interior is exactly as you would expect. And then on the right hand side, his filing system. Again, everything um, is made to, to look and feel like um, it is part of the same world. And I think the degree to which Margiela went to to do that um, was really quite astounding. And many of us, again, if I think about um, Selfridges and, and retailers, I suppose, we talk about um, retail theatre. And a lot of that means that what you see on the outside, this idea of theatre, is not necessarily what you see kind of behind the, the scenery, behind that facade. Um, 
but again, thinking about, um, you know, my own business, I'm really interested in thinking about how I can build a, a world sort of through and through. What does it mean to how I work? How do I, how do I um, work with suppliers or customers? Um, how do they become part of that world? Another great example, I think, is Prada. When they design a new collection, they essentially recreate their studio to become um, part of their collection. So really bringing things like the working process into this world. Um, first of all, it's just a really exciting, inspiring way to work. But there's real authenticity there. Um, and it builds more intuition, I suppose, because you are really living and breathing your brand. So that's the importance of world building. Um, but how are you going to get customers? So I'm not a marketeer and customer acquisition is absolutely not my specialty. But I do have, um, I suppose, some real interests in remembering the importance of the real world versus the digital. Um, I think many of us, again, our sort of strategy is, well, on digital, we can reach millions of people very, very quickly. So our reach is very, very wide. Um, and we tend to invest our time and our energy and, and certainly our money in the digital sphere. And that is very important. But I think brands are beginning to forget the importance of in real life versus the digital. I listened to a podcast the other day. Um, it's called um, How I Built This by Guy Raz. Um, if any of you guys haven't heard of that or haven't listened to it before it's it's just a really brilliant podcast um every episode interviews a um a business owner about how they started their brand and the story essentially of their brand and one of the recent episodes was on joe malone and she said that um one of the things she used to do she no longer um owns joe malone um, was a thing called walking the dogs and this was where they would pay cool looking customers to walk around town with empty Joe Malone bags and this would very often be um, in the run-up to a store launch and I think that in itself you know it's genius it's not the number of people who see those Joe Malone bags are going to be much less than probably the people who will see your digital content. However, um, the impact it has is likely to be much greater. So I just thought that was a, a really sort of um, nice and easy idea of getting your brand out there. Um, and then another couple of examples of that, that sort of um, physical uh, world. Diptyque, so think about your packaging and how that will live on after somebody has used your product. So many people now use uh, diptyque glasses as their sort of toothbrush holder or their um, you know, mascara holders, as you see there. It's become such a sort of phenomenon that there are even memes about it now. But I think it's, again, we can really learn lessons from that. How will people use your packaging, um, at, you know, once they've used your product? Um, how can you make it sort of that desirable that it, it's not something that, you know, people just throw away and discard? Again, net porte is a great one. People keep those amazing black boxes um, because they're so beautiful and they use them as storage boxes. And that means when people come into your house, they are seeing um, essentially this branding. So that is becoming, um, you know, part of their, their psyche, I suppose. Um, and then the other example I've got here is um, Stina Goya. Um, so she has been producing these sort of fashion week hoodies. Um, 
and again they're a beautiful product so if you give your you know these incredible hoodies to all the models in your show for example you then have these very cool people walking around with your with your branding on them um so they are quite sort of cynical ideas i suppose but um it's not always right for our um you know for brands to have their logo on on the outside of their garments anymore um but there are certain examples like this where i think it sort of really works and the thing i think that's most important to remember about this is the fact that people trust word of mouth recommendations more than anything else so about 92 percent of people trust word of mouth um and again if i think about how i have discovered products myself the things that i've really been compelled to try are very often things that um my friends have have told me about um or i have seen them wearing so just remember that your current customers are probably your most vital, important piece of advertising that you have. So what can you do for your current customers that will compel them to talk about your brand? And that's either knowingly or unknowingly by wearing your branding, essentially. And then just to throw in here, um, it, it's sort of semi related, I suppose, to this argument. Um, but it's something that really blew me away when I found this out. The average e-com conversion rate is 2.86%. And that rate is even lower for luxury fashion. If you think about that in terms of a sort of physical store, if you think about sort of 98 out of every 100 people walking in and then walking right out again. How depressing is that? Um, and I think, you know, in many ways, what we're doing with digital is this sort of spray and pray effect. You know, we're trying to get our message out in the hope that you'll get a couple of bites. Um, and it is effective and we all need to do that. But again, I'm just coming back to that point of let's not forget about the physical world. Um, okay, so moving on to your customer. Do you really know your customer? Um, so this is really, I suppose, about customer segmentation. Um, again, really being able to visualize your customer. Um, and understanding, I suppose, more than, okay, they're, you know, between the age of 20 and 35 and they, you know, um, I don't know, they work in the arts and they earn pots of money. Um, you know, who really are they? What's their lifestyle? And I think this is really important if, even if your customer, your ideal customer is somebody like you, a lot of businesses, you know, they start off um, creating product because, you know, the individuals themselves can't find the product they want. Um, so again, my own, my own business, I, um, I'm working on this side hustle because the kind of clothes I want to buy, I can't find. Um, so I am my own target customer. But even though I know that, I think it's really useful to sort of do a rigorous analysis of, you know, essentially who am I as a customer um, and really kind of spell that out. Um, I've got that. Um, this is a really bad example here. Sorry. But um, if I was building a, a sort of customer mood board around, you know, a, a Raven Smith type character, I might be thinking about um, what kind of things does he read? Where does he live? What does he um, do in his spare time? What transport does he use? What coffee shops does he go to if he drinks coffee? You know, what bars or restaurants does he go to? How does he work? What kind of profession is he in? Um, what kind of products does he buy already? Um, you know, what's he into? Um, and it's only really when you begin to dig into that, that you sort of get a real picture of what you're going after. And 
if you do that to sort of quite a, a rigorous effect, um, it's easier to understand how your customer is going to evolve as well. So if he's into this kind of stuff now, what's the next step um, for him? Um, so it, it's much easier to kind of follow that trajectory. These images um, have all come from cement.com. Um, it's just, it's a, a website that we love um, to look at every week, looks at a different uh, personality. They generally work in the creative industries. So this one's all about Raven Smith. Um, but it's a lovely profile essentially of um, a person and their, you know, their daily routines, what they do during the week, etc. Um, and it might, again, um, just give you some ideas of how you um, could build a customer mood board or the kind of things that you need to be thinking about. I've just done a quick uh, video of, of um, Luke Edward Hall um, that was on Smen. But as you can see, you know, it's looking at how does he live? What are his interiors? What are the books he's reading? Where does he go on holiday? Um, you know, what kind of lifestyle does he lead? What kind of products does he need when he goes on holiday? Um, what music does he listen to? Et cetera, et cetera. So the more you can build a really solid picture of who your customer is, the better. And this is really important actually, when we talk about the zeitgeist. Um, so the definition really of zeitgeist is a prevailing mood. Um, it's the prevailing ideas and beliefs of the time. And there is a general zeitgeist. So the prevailing mood or ideas, you know, going on in the world in its entirety. But if you think about it, um, the, the zeitgeist that different people feel or different types of customers will feel will actually be quite different. Um, if you're talking to Raven Smith, he will know one type of zeitgeist. If you're talking to Donald Trump, he will know a very different type of zeitgeist. So it's really important to tie in essentially the kind of um, zeitgeist you're looking at and who your customer is. Um, when it comes to looking at the zeitgeist and um, trend prediction, there are obviously um, some brilliant trend prediction sites. I'm sure everyone knows WGSN, um, LSN Global is my preferred one. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, Lee Edelcourt, again, she's a really fantastic trend forecaster. However, all of these people are extremely expensive um, and for good reason, because they have people all over the world um, scouring for, for trends. Um, and really asking themselves, what is the future? Um, and all of that is important, but I think the thing to remember is, you know, everyone's looking at WGSN, everyone's looking at LSN Global. So the kind of trends, the kind of zeitgeist you're beginning to know about is, is what every um, brand and retailer is looking at in the world. Um, so you're not necessarily going to stand out um, and you don't necessarily need to spend that much money as well to find out about um, what's going to happen in the future. Um, there's a great quote here from Harry Gordon Selfridge. People will sit up and take notice of you if you sit up and take notice of what makes them sit up and take notice. So it's obviously a bit of a, a mouthful, um, but really what he's saying here is just be observant really pay attention to what is going on in the world and and what people are thinking about and talking about and and you know how are they behaving and you can learn so much from that um but beyond that i would really recommend um beyond simply paying attention is build your own system in terms of, you know, how can you build this picture of what, what the zeitgeist is about? And the first step really in terms of building your own system 
is really knowing the poor, the importance of documentation. Um, very often, there will be something you note down that you you know is interesting in some way, but you won't recognise the importance of it until later on. Um, and it's only when you build up a certain amount of information that you can start to spot patterns. I think a um, a fun example, I suppose, um, I was thinking of the other day is we used to do a thing um, at work called the world this week, where we discussed every week essentially what we were, um, what was going on in the world. And we realized looking back on a few world this weeks that we had been talking about old people essentially. Um, it, older people kept coming up in our conversation. And from spotting that pattern and realizing the importance in it, we built a concept called Bright Old Things. And this was really all around the idea of um, people in their, their twilight years, I suppose, um, starting second or third careers, um, particularly starting their own creative businesses. Um, and it, it was a concept that worked really well for us and just taps into something that the sort of collective consciousness, I suppose, um, what people were interested in um, at the time. So document everything um, and then pay attention really to what you're documenting. I've popped um, on here a few things that I um, try to look at every day. So on the left is daily reads and this spans everything from creative, which um, are things like it's nice that, design boom, days digital, um, to culture and lifestyle, to fashion, to looking at culture and society, to looking at the news um, and business, and then um, trend sites themselves. So the things you look at absolutely don't have to be the same as this, but think about what is important, um, interesting to you, but also important to your customer. What are the kind of things that your customer is looking at um, and doing and, and um, you know, exposing themselves to all the time. And then on the right um, are the, this is just a few examples, I suppose, of the kind of people I follow. Um, so I set up a, a separate Instagram account for myself um, where I don't follow any of my friends. Um, I purely follow people that I think are very important to the zeitgeist and where the creative industries are going in the future. So who are the indicators of where things are going next? Again, the kind of people that you follow um, will almost definitely be different to this, but really pay attention to who you think are indicators of the future. And then I would really recommend setting up your own Instagram um, account, a, a really separate one, which just allows you, you know, scroll through that and you can straight away get a snapshot of where things are going. Uh, one other thing I would say to this is try not to follow too many people, actually. I think it's um, probably more important to be quite discerning in your edit um, so that you're just getting the sort of um, the juiciest information there. Um, and apart from that, um, the, the last thing I do is I have a Pinterest board that is literally called Zeitgeist. Uh, and then every time I um, see something, again, the, from the stuff of, uh, from my daily read section, for example, um, or images I take, etc., I throw it all onto that board. And then every few weeks, if you have a look at that board, you can begin to see patterns of the kind of things that are, are happening and possible features that might take place as a result. Um, okay, so moving on from the zeitgeist, um, building meaningful concepts. So <clears throat> this is something that I have very much learnt at Selfridges. It's a very different way of working on concepts compared to the um, fashion designers I worked with. Um, 
concepting in fashion um, in terms of the background I've had certainly is this idea of being very aesthetic driven, you know, are you inspired by a film or a certain movement in history? Um, you know, might it might be some kind of military insignia or a painter. It's that real driven, um, sort of visual aesthetic driven um, direction in terms of what is the not next concept of your collection, I suppose. Um, and we can afford to do things a little bit differently in retail. You could easily um, do trend-led concepts. So, you know, let's let's do a concept that's all about black and white. Again, you could be aesthetically led. Um, but the way we like to do things is very much about looking at, again, what's going on in the zeitgeist. What do we think will really resonate with people? So what are people really thinking and doing and are perhaps worried about at the time? Um, if that all sounds a bit weird, I've just got a couple of examples. Um, and both of these examples are from actually quite a long time ago now. And I thought really that would be useful because it allows you to see these concepts, um, I suppose, in context. Um, so the first one is no noise. And we did this back in 2013. So no noise was all about this idea that um, there's so much information, um, branding overload, busyness in the world, um, that we really need some kind of some space and some quiet. And this came about at a time where there was lots of talk about mental health, particularly. And looking back on this project now, it's quite interesting because, you know, even the concept of mental health now is something that people talk about all the time. But it absolutely wasn't, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. So no noise was really um, born out of this um, talk around um, mental health. And as you can see here, we tend to design our graphics um, to talk to, the, to our concepts. We look at the colors and the textures. In this particular um, scheme, we um, held debates, we held a mass meditation, um, and we looked at products and took away as much branding as possible. So we worked with Heinz Baked Beans, for example, and took all the logos off the tins. Um, so the, the sort of product development was super interesting as well. And um, you ended up with some very beautiful and still very recognizable product, minus all the noise, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and aligned with that was our, our window scheme, the top left window was um, a sort of breathing, it was almost like a mattress, I suppose. Again, very beautiful, absolutely no product in our windows. And the top right there was what we called the silence room. Um, so it was a place our customers could go, they could leave their phones at the door um, and they could go and just be quiet or they could meditate in there. I wish um, this, the silence room still existed now. It's certainly something that we would look at bringing back. Um, and then the other example was from 2015. So again, quite a long time ago now. Um, and <clears throat> we called this concept agenda. And this was at the time when, first of all, on the catwalks, we were seeing sort of a, a kind of new type of fashion that was genderless and it was genderless more than you know before that time you there was lots of androgynous kind of clothing but but not clothing that was was simply genderless it was also at a time where there was lots of talk about trans rights um and there was also discussion really about gender roles um in sort of in general it's something that um I am you know, personally particularly interested in. I think that's probably why I've, I've chosen this example. You know, I hate this idea that even now, you know, men take the bins out and women do the ironing. You know, it's, it's sort of such 
you know, strange roles that we have developed for ourselves. And it's time really to break those down, I think. Um, and it was also at a time when we noticed that um, men were shopping on our women's floors and vice versa. And it led us to think, you know, how ridiculous that as a store, we have separate men's and women's wear floors. Um, and very often these kind of zeitgeisty concepts um, lead us to question ourselves as a business and why we do business a certain way. We've also done concepts like um, the beauty project, which um, led us to question why we sell beauty in a certain way and how that makes people feel, for example. So we're always questioning ourselves as a business. Um, so the agenda concept, um, we created various concept stores which allowed people, this is one of them here, which was designed by Faye Toogood, um, it allowed people to buy product in a, in a sort of gender neutral space. Um, that was our website. Um, and we also created, created a fashion film. The thing I think to, to note here is we worked with Harry Neff. Um, this was choreographed by Ryan Heffington um, and filmed by Alex Turvey. So again, the kind of people we worked with at the time were um, sort of, you know, I want to say emerging creatives at the time. Again, Ryan Heffington is very, very established now. Um, we were really lucky to work with him early on. Um, so really, that uh, takes me to the end of everything to do with the zeitgeist and creative direction. I just wanted to finish on a couple of ideas around shifting consumer mindsets. And that is simply because of the, you know, the very odd times we're in now. I'm presuming everyone is thinking very hard about what... Um, you know what this time means to them and how they're going to change or pivot um, and adapt um, their models or, or products as a result. Um, <clears throat> I just want to share a couple of ideas I think that I'm thinking about and I think are important. The first one, Amanda, you and I talked about this at the beginning actually, but this is the idea of, of really the future of work. So we're beginning to see that um, employers are understanding that actually they don't necessarily need to see everybody in the office chained to a desk to ensure that work is being done. And um, almost quite the opposite, you know, many employers have found that their teams are much more productive when they are not commuting into the office every day. And it has also changed the mindsets of employees. You know, do they want a job anymore? That means that they have to go into the office every day. So what does that mean to the world of work? Um, the image on the top right, Sonder, I think these guys are interesting. Um, it's a bit like um, Airbnb apartments, I suppose, but with the quality of a hotel. You can stay for a day, but you can also stay for a month and continually extend your time. Um, and they are in sort of beautiful properties in interesting cities um, around the world, including London. So it's really just that notion of, you know, you could live in New York for a couple of months, but you're working for a business in London, for example. And that has been a possibility for a while, but it's becoming much more of a reality, I suppose, um, than it ever has been before. And another couple of things to note, uh, bottom left, the um, 700,000 hours hotel. This is the first sort of slow hotel. Um, it pops up um, every six months in a different location around the world. So this idea of travel, but working while you travel, um, could be super interesting. And then I've just dropped in a, a, a shot of Soho House there um, because if our offices no longer need banks of people chained to desks, what will be the purpose of offices? Um, 
something we certainly are discussing at Selfridges is this notion that it, it, the importance when you have people physically together is that social interaction. So when you do go into work, will going into work be about you know, hanging out with people, discussing things, it's, you know, it's when you want to have those brainstorms. So will the future of the office be much more of a social space, essentially? Um, and then the top left, again, lots of people are really excited about this idea of, you know, moving to the wilds, um, but needing super fast internet while they do it. Um, Another thing from a fashion point of view, um, this idea of cross-pollination. So two, I suppose, very long-term um, trends has have been this idea of athleisure um, on the left there, and then that sort of notion of pyjama dressing on the right. And I'm just really interested in what's the cross-pollination of those two trends, essentially. Um, what will the future of fashion look like when those two things come together? Um, when we're dressing for the home, um, but working from the home, what will we want to wear? I think it's actually very different to, um, you know, how we dress today. Um, super obvious trend, much more investment in the home and in gardens. Um, so people are spending less on things like travel and eating out because they can't. Um, and because of that, they have realised the importance of turning their, their homes and gardens into sanctuaries. Um, and then sort of off the back of um, the most recent BLM movements, um, as you guys all know, Beyonce has released a directory of black owned businesses. Um, she's obviously not the only one, lots of people have done this. Um, the thing that I think is super interesting about this is, um, and again, particularly for us as sort of, you know, small brand and business owners, is that it's no longer good enough to be a faceless brand. Um, transparency is absolutely key. People want to know who you are, who is the person that owns um, that business? Um, what are your values? How do you conduct your life? How do you treat people? Um, so that idea of um, transparency and responsibility um, is, is very, very important and is quite a shift um, compared to how we used to work before. And then lastly, the very last trend um, is the depressing notion that we are going into a recession and possibly a depression. Um, what are the kind of trends that are going to come out of that? Um, Will it be, you know, if you remember the last recession we had, um, supper clubs was something that came out of that, which was super exciting and creative. Um, will, will we get the return of the supper club? Um, baking is something that people are turning to, that, that sort of notion of something that's wholesome, um, that sort of takes time. Will baking become a big thing? Um, make do and mend. Um, Another example there of Bleach London, sort of people learning how to um, bleach their own hair. So all of those kind of trends that are about do it yourself, I think, will be a big thing um, because of the situation we're in now, but also coming out um, and into a recession. Um, and that takes me, apologies for the, the solid talking for um, an hour, that takes me to the, the end of the masterclass. Um, I shall stop sharing my screen and put my video back on. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much. Um, let me just... Would you mind making me host again? Oh yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That was really interesting. I think you kind of definitely kind of dived into all different areas there in a really kind of in-depth and inspirational way. Um, so I really enjoyed that. I hope everyone who um, has been watching has been listening and enjoyed that too. 
Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your time today, Emma. Um, it was an absolute pleasure as always, and really great to kind of hear about this from kind of a big brand aspect, but also a very small brand aspect. So I think you did really cover all of those areas very well. So thank you very much. Great. Um, yeah, that was great. Um, and yes, thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, if there was anything that you want to kind of catch up on, um, then this has been recorded and it will be available on YouTube following on from this. And um, just a couple of comments here saying it was so enlightening, fantastic. Thank you for your insights, Emma. So interesting, so inspiring. My brain is buzzing. Um, well, that is great feedback. So thank you for everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, and yes, we'll let you get back to the rest of your days. Um, and yeah, look forward to kind of hearing more and chatting with you guys further. So thanks so much again. Thank you guys. <laughs> Great. I will just end the end it there. So do I need to do that, Amanda? I think I've yeah you can just press end and that's fine okay great <laughs> <laughs> nice and easy